Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower in the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and the kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We worship the God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's a word we need to be reminded of over and over again. Because there are times when we feel like God is far away. Or there, is, there are times when we feel like God's anger is all that there is. But the truth is of a God who is compassionate as a loving parent, is compassionate to his children. And so as we worship a God who greets us daily with compassion, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's pray together. We bless you from our souls, Almighty God, for you have been to us. Your compassion is poured out to us daily. You are patient with us. And in all of these things, you are gracious to us. You meet us with a love that we don't deserve, a, a mercy that is beyond our worth. You love us that deeply. You love us when we are unlovely. And your love calls out the very best from us, from the depth of our souls. So we worship you, O oh Lord. We bless you with our souls. In these moments of worship, hear us blessing you as we sing, as we pray, as we listen to your word. May this time be a pleasant offering to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, through chapter 4, verse 11. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about all the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush, so it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thirty-one years ago, thirty years ago, I was helping lead a backyard Bible club, and I was telling these children in a, in a difficult, a rough neighborhood, I was talking to them about a, something that Jesus taught. Mama. If someone takes your coat, Mama. give them your shirt as well. And some boys in that group, around 9 and 10 years old, said, What? Are you crazy? If somebody takes my coat, they're going to take one of these with them as well. Or something like that. More on that in a minute. Let's set the scene here. You may be very familiar with the story of the prophet Jonah, he is unlike any other prophet in the Hebrew scriptures. Usually the prophet gets a word from God and they go to declare it and they are opposed. And it seems that it's just the prophet himself there with God and those are the only two folks who are on the same page. God gives Jonah a message to take to Nineveh and let's just say that Jonah is a little bit reluctant about that. Well, that's not true. He is a lot reluctant about that. He doesn't want to. God tells Jonah to get up and go to Nineveh, and Jonah gets up and goes in the opposite direction. He gets on a boat heading the opposite way. While he's on that ship, a great storm comes upon the sea, the crew of the ship feel like something is not quite right here, that they are cursed. They begin to throw all the cargo overboard to lighten the load so that they won't sink. And Jonah knows why the storm has come. And he tells them, it's me. I'm the problem. If you throw me overboard, you'll be okay. 
Now, they're reluctant, but they do it. And it seems like if you, as you read the story, the moment Joseph water, the storm just goes away. So the crew of the ship are like, what's going on here? They stop and offer sacrifices to God because they're afraid. Well, this, the part of the story that we like is that God sends a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And he spends three days inside the belly of this great fish. He says a beautiful prayer and the fish spits him out. Something about that. Jonah washes up on the shore, half digested, <laughs> and God speaks to him again. Are you, are you ready to go to Nineveh now? Get up and go there and preach the message that I give you to speak. So Jonah is more of, as he gets to Nineveh and walks a day's journey into the city, he's probably looking like more of what we would expect a prophet to look like. His, his clothing has been digested by the stomach acid of a great fish. He, I think he looks the part and maybe smells the part. And he announces the message that God gives him. A five-word sermon in Hebrew. Forty more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And the whole city takes him seriously. He may as well have been carrying a sign that said it. The whole city takes him seriously. They begin to repent. They fast. They put on sackcloth and ashes. And the king watches his people doing this. And he finds out why. And he declares a fast for the whole nation. Not just the people. But the animals too. And the king says, we'll do this. Who knows? Maybe God will change God's mind. Well, of course, God sees this act of repentance. And God decides to not punish Nineveh. And that brings us to where this passage picks up today. Jonah plays a part here of what we, we could compare it to the older brother of the prodigal son story that we read in the Gospels. The younger son had, had gone away and blown his inheritance on wild living and all of this stuff, and he comes back home and dad throws a party for him. And the older brother stands outside the house and he pouts. Jonah watches God pull away from this anger, pull away from this wrath. And Jonah pouts. Jonah says he would rather die than watch Assyria receive mercy. Jonah didn't preach mercy. Jonah didn't show up with, hey, good news. God loved none of this Roma Downey at the end of Touched by an Angel stuff. God loves you. Jonah wasn't glowing. He was digested. And you know, so he doesn't show up with the good news and better news if you repent. But just the announcement of wrath. Just the announcement of doom, 40 more days, and your city will be destroyed. Jonah was resentful that Assyria would receive mercy. And we can't blame him. 
In 722 BC, Sennacherib of Assyria invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. And oh, the story gets told a little too lightly for us. We just kind of master it by the bare facts of it. Um, Assyria invaded, destroyed things, and hauled the people off into exile. But Sennacherib was really a lot more cruel than the stories we hear. Um, if you were defeated by him, he wanted to let you know without a doubt that you had lost. In the archaeologists have discovered in a room in his uh, in his castle in his mansion it's labeled Room Twenty Six, so you get the picture here. A, a, a mural they found in this this room of his soldiers whipping the, the people he had brought away from Israel. And he didn't have the greatest relationship with other countries around him either. Um, about 90 to 80 years later, as Babylon comes into power, they make sure they go through Assyria to get to Israel and Judah. And on the way, they take some revenge for what Sennacherib had done to them. They, they destroy statues of Assyria's kings along the way. Um, so Babylon and Elam um, had some, some revenge as a note in their, uh, their armed invasion um, coming through Assyria down into Israel and Judah. You couldn't blame Jonah for being resentful here. God sends him to Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. And Jonah can't help but remember, Jonah can't help but understand not only how he feels, but how almost everybody else from his country would have felt about Assyria. They hadn't just taken their jacket. They had taken their coats and their sweaters and their shirts, their family members, they had completely destroyed their country. So Jonah is not alone in his anger. Jonah is not alone in his feelings of resentment. Jonah preaches his message and looks for destruction. It is almost as if when he gets those five words out of his mouth, he expects to look up in the sky and see the flaming meteors heading their way. But it doesn't happen. He preaches and he looks for destruction. He perches himself up on a hill and he has a front row seat to see God be merciful. He didn't buy a ticket for that show. So Jonah pouts. He knew it. He knew this was how it was going to work out. That Assyria would receive mercy. He even says this back to God. I know you're going to do this. He quotes scripture back to God. I knew you were going to do this. You are a God of steadfast mercy. Mercy, abounding in steadfast love, slow to anger. I know this about you. I've been taught this about you since I was a little kid. Why in the world wouldn't you let me stay home and you just be merciful on your own? It's a good question. Because not only was God in pursuit of Assyria, to be merciful. 
But God was also pursuing Jonah with mercy. God was pursuing the merciless with mercy. God was pursuing the hard-hearted with mercy. And that merciless and hard-hearted one just happened to be Jonah. God doesn't leave him to sit on his hill. Either to have his front row seat to watch destruction or to have a place high up where everybody else could look up and see him pout. And God asks Jonah, should I not be concerned? Should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city? Third time God has said this. Probably the third time Jonah's gotten annoyed at hearing God say it. Should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know their right hand from their and also as many animals. God is comprehensively merciful toward Nineveh. And God's, you know, basically God is saying to Joe here, if, if this is what you knew about me, that I was slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, shouldn't I be concerned about Nineveh? Well, the book ends right there. We don't get to hear Jonah's answer. We don't get to hear Jonah say one word. I think it's on purpose. I think this, this abrupt ending happens on purpose in order that we have to think about the condition of our own hearts as well. We are left to imagine how we would respond to God's question. How would we feel about God's mercy toward someone else when we ourselves feel merciless? Even if we're right. No, that's, that's kind of subjective there. Because even if the whole rest of the world would tell us we're right to feel merciless, God's got other things in mind. Are our hearts set on wrath? Are our hearts set on revenge? Even when the rest of the world would tell us you're right to feel that way. And I feel that way too. Is there a part of your life and my own life that can, can thrive and foster this wrath and this anger and this vengeance? Is there a part of your life and my life that can be without compassion because we've been treated without compassion? I think those kids in the Backyard Bible Club understood it that way. They didn't have very much to begin with. And here comes this comfortable 22-year-old white guy to tell them, Jesus says, if somebody takes your coat, give them some more. It's, it's the opposite of what we expect, the opposite of how we would react. Probably one of the hardest teachings that Jesus ever put out there was this from the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That might be harder to do than to take Jesus seriously and literally about taking up a cross and following him. Because there are times when we would rather be nailed to a cross beside Jesus than to practice the vulnerability necessary 
to love and forgive someone who has done something wrong. Through Jesus, we learn about God's sweeping and inclusive love. We'll quote him. Jesus taught Nicodemus, for God so loved the world. And yet we put an asterisk by that sometimes, but it's maybe not that part of the world that I'm mad at right now. Jesus says, love your enemies, and yet we continue to create enemies, not for the sake of having more people to love, but that we want to exact some revenge. And even in doing that, the world might tell us we're right, and yet we're nowhere close to what God thinks. So when our journey through Lent toward Easter takes us to the cross, we pause there to see what the sweeping and inclusive love of God does for us and for others. To challenge us even in the moment when we feel merciless. To have mercy. And the sweeping and inclusive love of God includes a category that we often refer to, those people. And God asks us, shouldn't I also be concerned about them? And we know the answer. Because we join Jonah in quoting scripture to God. God, I know that you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And at the same, with the same breath, we should also say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And pray it again, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on them. Here's a little spiritual exercise for you. Take Jonah 4.11. And change, change the references to Assyria and Nineveh to include the people and places that you're having a problem with. And so you would pray this verse, changing the details to, to fit the people that you are resentful toward. And in this way, you will be praying about them using God's own words. But you'll be participating in something that has been for everlasting and everlasting. The steadfast love of the Lord being poured out for the sake of all people. Even those people. When Jesus teaches about the kingdom, he talks about leaving the 99 to go and find that one lost sheep. We are called to participate in how Jesus extends this love of God to people that we have written off for a long time. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, there will be more <coughs> rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous folks who are doing okay by themselves. Let's find ourselves rejoicing with Jesus and the host of heaven, rather than stuff that looks like this. Amen.
ways to love and serve the Lord, the prophet Micah teaches us well. He's shown you more than what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. Amen. to love and serve the Lord, the prophet Micah teaches us well. He's shown you more than what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen.